Good evening. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Oh, hello to people on Zoom. I quite can't hear you. <laughs> uh, good evening. Welcome. My name is Mark Lainsmith. I am the Anglican chaplain at the University of Reading. Uh, and uh, welcome to Cafe Theologique. If it's your first time, a really special welcome. If you've been before, I don't care. Um, Cafe Theologique happens twice, or sometimes if you're really lucky, three times an academic term. And the idea behind it is to take a theological topic or to take a, a secular topic but from a theological angle and to explore that with a guest speaker. Um, and uh, so we, we try and look at different types of topics throughout the year. Which means if there's a particular speaker that you would like to hear or a topic that you would like to hear explored, tell me because I'm looking now for the next six speakers for the coming academic year. So do have a word with me afterwards. Uh, this event is recorded. It's both on Zoom and in person, and the Zoom recording will be eventually uploaded onto YouTube, uh, where it sits alongside another a, a number of other recordings. So if you liked the theme of tonight uh, and you want to see what else might be there, just type into Google or other search engines that might be available, Cafe Theology, and you'll find some YouTube videos. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, I, just before I do that, I will say, I'll comment, this is the biggest turnout that we have had post-pandemic. I'm hey, leaving. Hey. <laughs> You're feeling nervous yet, you? And, and, and obviously that's partly about just getting back to normal. I think also it might be about the topic. And I think that's really interesting in itself. Uh, so let me introduce Stuart. Uh, I came across Stuart through the Church Times. Uh, because Stuart wrote a book called um, uh, Autistic Thinking in the Life of the Church. Uh, I, have, I don't know why I'm not saying that. Here it is. Here's his book, copies of which are on sale afterwards for £13 if you'd like. Um, and um, this came out of his master's thesis that he began in 2017. This is very much a, a second career for Stuart. His background is over 25 years in project management and program management. He's worked for, um, among other companies, uh, HBOS and Lloyds. Um, he's now a trustee with the uh, National Autistic Society, and I think you're moving on to do a PhD, aren't you? I am. I am, so yes. a PhD in Aberdeen, I think. In Aberdeen, yes. The, um, I couldn't find anywhere further away. <laughs> the Centre for Autism and Theology, I think, which I'd not heard of before. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, speaking on the topic of autism and theology, what can autistic, theology, uh, autistic thinking offer to the church? Uh, let's welcome Stuart Rapley. And I should say, Stuart's going to for about half an hour, 45 minutes, we'll pause. So you can refresh your glasses for a drink or go for a pee if you're on Zoom. Uh, and then we'll come back for Q&A and we'll finish by nine. So Stuart, take us away. Fantastic. Thanks, uh, Mark. And uh, it's great to be here, um, to actually be here. I'm from Manchester. And as you probably all experienced coming out of the pandemic to actually get to an event that is really happening at something. So Mark contacted me and said, what about this? Um, so from Manchester, that's quite a, a journey to take to be here. Um, but the date just worked out that I was in the area yesterday evening. So how about that? So it's good to be with you um, and with you here and those online. So uh, just to position this a little bit. Uh, yes, I'm a trustee at the National Autistic Society. I'm on the autistic spectrum myself. So um, so I am autistic. So this is lived experience and the lived experience of the people that I researched with in the course of my master's dissertation and then writing the book. So um, I'm very much about um, developing what I call a match of the day dialogue. So I'm not looking tonight to make you into experts on autism, but if you, if you watch match of the day, you can have a sensible conversation with somebody who likes football. And that's the philosophy that I have with things like tonight. So um, I'm going to be talking about understanding autism from a lay person's point of view. So I do believe that uh, we've got quite a few psychologists in the in the room tonight. So this is really um, Daniel in the lion's den time. So I'll be kind of stoned from all angles here. Um, 
how autism impacts spirituality and faith and then uh, what kind of contribution might autistic people be able to make to the life of the church and then as mark said uh, we'll have some q a and discussion so just in terms of understanding autism and a few starting points so i don't know where you are coming from um, as you uh, sit and uh, listen to this this evening so perhaps uh, an autistic person for you is somebody who's fairly awkward socially and uh, says inappropriate things or deemed to be inappropriate so you possibly can't see the speech bubbles there but the, the woman is saying you know the, the hackney old phrase is my bum look big in this answer yes absolutely enormous um, <laughs> Maybe it's um, a person who is likely to behave in strange ways, perhaps in, in the public arena, perhaps have a meltdown. Um, maybe it's the kind of person you hear about on the news that's managed to hack into the computer systems at the Pentagon, um, or perhaps something else. So we're probably coming at this from a range of angles. I'm going to describe briefly two types of brain. So this is kind of neuroscience in three minutes. I don't know why I'm trying this. Um, so the first type of brain, then uh, the word neurotypical, is that, is that familiar to you? Anyway, so somebody who is not autistic, basically. Well, we can't just say not autistic, I don't know, but there we go. Um, so there's a brain. And I like to describe this um, type of brain as processing information with a relational bias. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that the way that brain filters information, because our brains are just bombarded with sensory information all day, every day. So the way the brain filters that and then gets meaning out of it is on the basis of how does this work in terms of relationships? How does this, what does this tell me uh, about people? And I, I'm just kind of throwing a quote in there. Simon Baron Cohen wrote a book after I did my dissertation, I hasten to add, called The Pattern Seekers. And he talks about the empathy quotient. So what, what the brain then does is filters information into what's, what's irrelevant and what's relevant. So there you are in a cafe, in a restaurant, and you are talking to your friend and your brain zones out all the stuff in the background, the lorries and the buses are going past outside the window and so on. And you're focused on that conversation in front of you. And just as evidence that our brain kind of gets all of this other information, of course, as soon as somebody mentions your name right across the other side of the restaurant, you're, you're right in there. So, so that's what the brain is doing. Um, there's increasing evidence in neuroscience that that the brain doesn't just receive information and process it, but it actually brings stuff to the party as well. And so the brain is bringing out past experience and understanding of context, um, attitudes and expectations, what it's expecting to hear or see or whatever. Um, and then of course, there's the interpretation and reading of body language, tone of voice, things that are not said, that's a killer. Um, so things that people don't say, as well as the actual words in a conversation. And so what, what the brain is doing then is taking all of that relevant information from all of those sources and say, all oh, right, okay, that's what this means. That's what's going on. And the rest of it then is sort of filed away. Um, we don't necessarily have access to it in our subconscious, but it's, but it's there. Contrast that then with an autistic brain and I like to suggest that an autistic brain has a systemic bias. And what I mean by that is that the same processes are going on of filtering and inferring meaning, but now the criteria and the question is, does this fit in my system? Okay, so this is a much more binary way of processing information. And so the question then in terms of filtering is, is this consistent with, with my system? in which case I can process it. If it's inconsistent, doesn't fit, it's illogical, whatever it is, then it's noise. And when you get to all of this other stuff, 
what the autistic brain does is picks up the actual words that people are saying uh, that fit in with its system. And then the rest of it is just jangling around in your head as noise. So do I see body language? Yes. Do I get any meaning out of it? No. And so what, what you can imagine is that all of this noise in the head then creates a sense of anxiety. And that can be either mild anxiety, which is there most of the time, and most autistic people will tell you that they have that sense of anxiety. Um, and if the stimulus keeps going and keeps going, you can imagine that builds up. And at some point, you know, boom, you know, the person throws the toys out of the pram because they, they just can't cope. So two types um, of brain. I'm going to use an analogy now. So an analogy is not the whole picture. It's an example um, of some aspects. OK, so this is a bit risky. So I'm going to compare an autistic person with a computer. I'm not saying autistic people are like computers, but there are some aspects of the way a computer works that are helpful. So a computer has a processor hardware works on zeros and ones or strictly speaking ons and offs um, and then it creates logic gates if this then that if not not that then the other and so on you try and put an a in there it either breaks the system or it ignores it doesn't do anything what we then do is we layer software on top of it layer upon layer of it some of that software is about how do you translate between machine language and the world outside some of it is about choices so i'm running a, an email program or i've decided to to write a document or look at pictures um, play games music um, films and so on so at the user interface there's a million different varieties of what that computer looks like dependent then on the software that's been loaded on but underneath still with the processor and the cadence of that processor i.e it works on rules and so on is still visible even if you're watching a film even if you're playing a game it still has to function on rules and it, and it only operates on the data that's there so there's so it's it's disguised but it's still there so for an autistic person, they have that sort of neurological makeup that is very binary, very systemic. It either fits my system or it doesn't. Um, but many of us have learning capabilities, so we can learn all kinds of skills and behaviors and tricks and coping strategies and rules. And so, um, you know, I, I seem very comfortable in this environment. You say, well, he doesn't look very autistic, um, doesn't seem very autistic. Well, that's because I've learned um, how to cope. And then that then presents the autistic person you meet. And so when you then sort of get talking to autistic people, they say, oh, well, um, once you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. You can't generalize. Uh, you know, and if you're not careful, you end up thinking, well, I don't, I don't know anything in that case. I, I don't know where I stand. So what I'm saying to you is, yes, of course, the person you meet might be one of a million different varieties. But then underneath that, you will have these learning capabilities. And underneath that, there will be a, a neurological engine at work that has those systemic um, tones that are working. So just to summarize that, when we think about autism, we need to think about processing, um, the brain processing information. We need to think about learning and we need to think about context. And so when we use the word autism or we talk about somebody being autistic, um, are we referring to their processing characteristics or are we describing how they function in a context or are we talking about how their learning capabilities interact um, with their processing and so on? Now, all of those things are possible and that there isn't an agreed um, way amongst all of the communities that talk about autism of what autism is and how to describe it. 
So just things to watch out for. Some people may appear autistic. You think, yep, got that one. Um, other people might not appear um, as autistic. Uh, so beware. Uh, people may suddenly struggle with a change of context. So me at school, behind a desk, in the classroom, fantastic, especially doing maths, great. Two minutes later, in the playground, completely lost. Standing there like a lemon, no idea what anybody else is doing, what I'm supposed to do, how to join in, anything like that. Um, so uh, church, service, fine. Two minutes later, coffee after church, chaos. No idea what to do. I just stand there and wait till my wife's finished talking to people, and then we go home. Um, the other thing to be aware of, if you've ever traveled to a foreign country and tried to spend your time speaking a foreign language that you've learned, it's hard work. And at the end of the day, you feel tired. And a lot of autistic people will talk about things being tiring because they are operating on the basis of learned skills when others may be doing things instinctively, reading body language. So, you know, that's a skill one can learn and so on and so forth. So having talked about it, uh, being in a foreign country, how about this one? You arrive in Tokyo that uh, you don't know anything about Japanese, don't know the language, don't know the culture. And all of a sudden you're faced with all of these squiggly symbols, can't interpret them at all. Okay, so you can't make any sense of any of the information you've got around you. Uh, you can't order a drink in a cafe. No idea whether they even do that. Um, you have difficulty talking to a taxi driver who's busy talking about his uh, favorite football team there, by the way, if you are into Japanese. You know. um, and you are therefore completely unable to participate. And so, so some people who are autistic will be nonverbal because for whatever reason, they're just unable to process and recognize the symbols and signs and information that they get uh, around them. And you'd be confused by many of the customs. And uh, so you're gonna get things wrong. So question, how do you feel? Well, possibly isolated, probably on the fringe, rather excluded, maybe a bit lonely, a bit fed up. How would things change if you learn some Japanese, assuming that you can learn some Japanese um, and appropriate cultural behaviors? Well, you probably start to fit in and feel a bit more included and so on and so forth. So that's just a few thoughts on understanding autism. So let's think then about autism and faith and how that works in the church context. Well, when I did my MA, I came across a lot of stuff that was written about church as a social event. So um, being greeted at the door, being asked to stand up and, and talk cheerily to strangers, um, sharing the peace, uh, coffee after church, come to our meeting, come to our meeting, come to our meeting, and so on. Lots of, lots of stuff written about that. Quite a lot of stuff written about church as a sensory um, event. Two things there. The one we probably think of straight away, you know, the bright lights and loud music and so on, all that sort of stuff. But also increasingly autistic people writing about experiences that they've had, because autistic people can, if you remember the filtering thing, um, they get, can get very direct, and very intense experiences. Now, whether those are spiritual or not is, is a whole kind of question of interpretation, but there are quite a few beginning now to talk about having quite intense experiences of God. So my interest then, uh, and where I found very little written, once you get past all those issues, what about church as a cognitive event? Because we, we function, particularly in the Western tradition, on a lot of text-based stuff, and we're presented with the faith. And a lot of the stuff that was written um, in this space was really written about learning difficulties, mostly for children, and so it was aimed at, here is the faith, how do we get this into the heads of these children? My question was the other way around is, you know, my head says that faith doesn't make any sense. What do we do with that? So there's a kind of progression here. Yes, of course, we need to start with the accessibility issues and the welcome issues to make people feel at home and, and that they need a, a quiet space to go and all of those things. So 
absolutely. Once we then move past that, we're into this systemic thinking where one of the aspects is going to be, I'm looking for things to be logically consistent. So things that don't fit together, don't make sense. You know, it's like a picture that's not hanging straight on the wall. It just kind of does your head in. And that's hard to communicate about being autistic because people say, oh, yes, I noticed that picture. Yes, but this has been keeping me awake at night for a month. And, and it's, it's, it's that that's difficult to communicate. So the second thing um, then is, yes, it needs to be uh, systemic, but it needs to fit my system. And if it's not working for me, I'm out. Um, and once we got past that, then we can think about, is there a distinctive contribution that we can make? And uh, this is a, a, a somewhat simplistic approach, but you will find people in all kinds of spaces. But I would suggest three uh, primarily, just to keep it simple. First of all, I don't know if you can read that there, but it just says uh, made peace. So, so that's green. So people that have made peace with their church, they've figured out a way of making it work. And these were the people I went to talk to. Um, there will be another group of people that are on the edge. They're kind of struggling. They're hanging in there maybe, you know, are they going to leave next week? Don't know. Uh, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? And there'll be some autistic people who've just said, this, this doesn't make any sense. I'm off. And, and they're very negative about their church or the church or the belief in God generally or whatever. So you will find people um, in all of those spaces, I would think. My research was about the ones in the green space. I didn't really want to confuse the whole thing with mixed motives as to why people were upset about things and so on. So these are all positive people. Okay, so um, we're talking about the cognitive side of faith. So the first thing I talked to them about, what about your concept of God? And this then sort of moved along a line um, as to whether we thought of God in, a, in an anthropomorphic way. In other words, God as a person, God as a being with whom we can have a relationship? Or do we think of God in a non-anthropomorphic way, God not as a person, a spirit, um, a force, something like that? And the, the general preference amongst the autistic people I talked to was for the non-anthropomorphic approach to God. And so there, um, I've just quoted um, Paul Tillich, um, a theologian who talked about God as the source of all being rather than God as a being. And when it comes to prayer, then if you think about God in an anthropomorphic way, about having a relationship with God, it makes sense to think about prayer as talking to God or talking with God. Okay. If you think non anthropomorphically about God, that doesn't really make much sense. So perhaps it makes more sense to think about prayer in the context of being in God, being with God. And, and that's what my research participants started to articulate to me. Um, so that they, they saw um, prayer rather than as a sort of transactional activity that they went through um, in this relationship context as something that they did a bit like the Apostle Paul talking about the God in whom we live and move and have our being uh, at the end of Acts. So what about the Bible then? Well, we probably think that autistic people tend to take things fairly literally, what they read. Okay, so that's true. Um, so the question then became, can we read and understand the Bible naturally, as it were, um, or do we need help with interpreting it? And my participants were very, they're, they're quite kind of self-aware people here. And they took the view, look, I tend to take things pretty literally. Uh, that's not a great idea with the Bible. Um, so, so I, but I need help with interpreting it. Um, but they saw their neurotypical friends in the congregation as being much more confident about interpreting, reading, interpreting the Bible for themselves. So it obviously means this, it obviously doesn't mean that, and so on. Whether they're right about that, it's not a matter. Um, and then what I called supporting texts, so creeds, liturgies, hymns, and songs. And this depends a little bit on the tradition you come from, of course, but 
But those are all there, aren't they? Um, um, even if you are in a sort of non-liturgical tradition, there'll be lots of hymns and songs and so on. And the discussion here was then as to whether this was seen as something of a community reinforcement exercise, a bit like a football crowd with their chants and so on. Isn't it great, you know, kind of bonds the community together and so on. Um, or whether it was about reminding us of um, what we believe and articulating um, the things that we believe. And of course, uh, in many cases, in days gone by when people couldn't read so much, then that was a very useful function. And the autistic people, uh, it said that they spent most of their time analyzing the words. Um, and they were less worried about the sort of communal aspect, but they saw the rest of the congregation. It's not that they thought the words didn't matter or anything like that, but the, the, the focus was on um, being together um, here today, other churches around the country, around the world, but for the last 2000 years, linking us with history and so on. So fantastic. And, and that's what my wife would say. Um, me, I'm thinking, yeah, but it's it's nonsense. That doesn't, you know, disagree with the sermon and you know, so on and so forth. So, um, <clears throat> so that's those four aspects. Um, and I'm not expecting you to read every jot and tittle on this, but so this is one of the summary uh, mappings that I came up with. So all of the systemic um, emphasis aspects are on the left, the relational emphasis on the right. The blue stripes are the participants themselves, the green, the churches that they were in, and the orange, their congregations. And what really kind of came out in terms of summarizing was that the churches were perceived to be broadly central, but with a leaning in the relational direction in terms of what they presented, and the congregations even more so. Uh, interesting, um, slight exception on prayer there. I haven't got time to to go into that. Um, the perceived gap, therefore, between the participants and the churches was um, not inconsiderable. Most of them saw themselves either right on the fringe of the church or beyond it, um, uh, with an even bigger gap between them and the congregation. Now, this is as they perceived it. Might have got a different answer if you talk to other people. So, so couple of questions that this posed then. First of all, is their church engagement at risk? They're clearly making it work, they're hanging in there, but from a cognitive point of view, this doesn't seem to kind of work for them. So something else is holding it together, but there could be a risk there. And the second thing was, in, in what they've articulated to me, does that constitute a um, a valid perspective that they could bring to the church that might sort of restore that off-centre balance. Because when you think about it, all of those emphases are there in the Christian tradition. So it's not a case of, you know, th this is in and that's out. So, so they then highlighted a number of things that they thought the churches could work on. Um, First of all, in terms of education and comms, it'd be great if uh, churches are more aware about autism. Theological assumptions um, that are often um, unspoken and unworked out as to um, what we're doing with um, autistic people. Who are they? What are they? Do they need to be cured? Do they need to be healed? Um, you know, is it a case of demon possession? What All kinds of things that you find. I've heard a Christian uh, leader at a big uh, meeting talking about um, the vaccination Thing, which in his view caused his two-year-old son to become autistic and he was praying that he'd be healed. Um, <clears throat> equipping in Bible interpretation and then the potential value of having access to more specialist resources as and when you need them perhaps regionally or nationally. So here's a, uh, some fun examples. So Jesus says, Luke 6, 30, give to everyone who asks you. Well, how would you decide? Um, so as a, as a Christian um, at university, I thought, good, right, off I go. Um, now, a friend of mine in a, in a cafe not so uh, long ago said, well, it obviously doesn't mean that. Um, otherwise, you'd end up bankrupt. Well, I, I did. <laughs> um, so why but why why obviously isn't the lord my provider i mean you know so 
um, I, metaphor. So, you know, autistic people don't, you know, sometimes struggle with that. So the Lord is my shepherd. Well, in, in what sense? And uh, so um, I had a group of guys from our church talk about that. Okay, fine. All the usual stuff, right? So I, I wandered into the group and I said, well, so is God going to give me a haircut then? Um, because that's what shepherds do with sheep and that's a kind of uh, shear them every now and again well obviously not obviously well why obviously how would you decide some aspects of a shepherd yes some aspects of a shepherd no okay um what advice would you give to a preacher who's preparing to speak to uh, a group of people where there might be autistic people that well the son of man had nowhere to lay his head that we must all be like christ um now, you, you might think, well, nobody's actually going to say that sort of thing in a sermon, are they? <laughs> I can promise you I've heard plenty. I've even preached a few. Um, how would you prepare to lead a discussion group in which autistic people are involved? Now, um, you speak to a lot of autistic people, and I think lockdown's been terrific. You know, Zoom... Um, and uh, teams and all of that sort of stuff. So don't speak all at once, but uh, put your hand up one at a time. Uh, it's a bit like being at school and just put your hand up. Um, each person has two minutes or whatever it is to say their bit. So, so some of that stuff that we've had to get used to in lockdown is really good for autistic people, but just try having a bun fight where everybody talks at once, you know. Um, so, is this an, a valid perspective on faith? Well, here are some indicative thoughts. I'm not going to uh, be able to do very much with this this evening, but Karl Barth, for example, um, talks about the event of God and the hiddenness of God and expressed some um, concerns about the way in which we just talk quite um, lightly about having a relationship with God. Paul Tillich, perhaps less well known as a theologian, talks about God as the God above God. So I'm going to take time to sort of untangle what that means. Um, around the periphery of the church, often not in the center stage, but there are the mystical traditions and the cloud of unknowing, that sort of thing. So definitely there in the church. Um, and just as an adjunct to this, some of the people I talked to who had grown up in the church or who had theological training were quite comfortable with the language of relationship and, you know, uh, theism and so on, you know, God as the father, the first person of the Trinity, all of that sort of stuff. As long as it was seen that this was language, not the reality. Um, we need a language to be able to talk about it, but it, it's just language. So some adaptations then. So let's think about the contribution. Um, they mentioned four. The first one, selective attendance. You can think, well, what's so unusual about that? Don't we all do that, don't we? Decide to go to some things and not others. Well, surely. But, but this would be on a very systemic basis. You know, I don't go to events where. So one person said to me, I'd be very unlikely to go to a church service at Christmas, for example, because too busy, too noisy. Too, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's a bit sad, isn't it? Um, second thing, personal reading. Well, we encourage everybody to read, don't we? So, but these people were reading as an alternative to what they've been told at church and, not, and sometimes as a, an antidote. Um, and sometimes during the sermon, uh, reading. <laughs> Um, attending more than one church. So some of them, you know, go to church A with their family and then go somewhere else for their own benefit. Um, and very simple one, just being selective about what they took on as a responsibility in the church, you know, perhaps a bit more behind the scenes or something like that. And just to remind you that these were all um, enthusiastic, committed people um, who were seeking to sustain uh, their engagement with church um probably through other routes rather than through dealing with the cognitive issues so just come back to that rebalancing then so perhaps autistic perspectives offer a way of rebalancing the scales um, and i would suggest that learned skills can sometimes outperform instinct so my friends who say they can interpret the Bible 
just by reading it because it's obvious what it means um, actually learning how to interpret it can put you in a stronger place because they could be importing all kinds of 21st century assumptions. So here's one from a seminar I went to, person talking about taxation. Fantastic. Matthew 22, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Well, yeah, but 2,000 years ago, taxation was all about kings and despots raising money from mostly poor people to fund their empire building armies and all the rest of it. Now, three quarters of the money we pay in tax goes to the National Health Service and you know, social care, education, and that sort of thing. So if you really want to do an analogue in the scriptures, you'd have to look at gleanings and tithings and all kinds of other things. You can't just use the word taxation. So very simple example there. So just to end then on a couple of uh, frequently asked questions. Well, at least I think they're frequently asked. I've heard them up. Um, do people always like structured liturgical prayer and services? Well, the answer is yes and no. Um, so there are two aspects to being systemic. One is, is it logically consistent? And there are autistic people who like the structure and the sameness in the liturgy and who find that calming. Okay, so in terms of logical consistency, that's a winner. But the other factor is, does it fit my system? And so there'll be other autistic people who say, I don't like it because it doesn't say what I'm trying to say. Does that make sense? But they're both thinking about it systemically. And, and, and yet you get this sort of computer thing that sort of says, well, hang on a minute. I thought autistic people like that. But now, you know, no, there's a whole variety, but all based on the same underlying need for it to be systemic. So what happens if it is not systemic is you get cognitive dissonance building up. You know, when you look at the picture and it's not straight, and some of that's good because you just get out of your chair and straighten it. If that builds and builds, it becomes uncomfortable. It becomes painful in the, um, in the extreme um, and will lead to a meltdown. And all of a sudden, person leaves church. Well, what, sorry, they were, seemed to be happy for the last 10 years. One of them suddenly walked out. Okay, question number two. Um, don't autistic people like uh, or prefer more fundamentalist churches? Well, yes and no. Um, the logical consistency question, again, some of those churches tend to be strong on systematic theology, biblical inerrancy, this is what the Bible says, and it's nice and clear. Good, tick. But does it, does it fit my system? And if, if the resulting biblical truth doesn't work with your lived experience, then we're very binary. Sorry, that doesn't work for me. That's a zero. So it's not a kind of compromise, you know, either works or it doesn't, boom, I'm out. And in my experience, I used to be involved uh, in an organization. I, I wouldn't call it necessarily quite fundamentalist, but it was pretty near. Uh, and my observation would be that whilst you remained inside the enclave, you can maintain the consistency. As soon as you try to then mix um, what was going on inside and what's going on outside, it tended to create more issues, but that's just a, a personal view. Um, so the answer to that, yes and no. Um, so you may well find autistic people who hold a range of beliefs about God and faith. I'm not saying they'll all be the same. I only interviewed nine people. They were from mainstream um traditions so three anglicans catholic baptist so um but they will all demand logical consistency and personal alignment so there we go something to stir up a bit of discussion maybe wow there was a huge amount of yeah let's give a round of applause